Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You're listening to It's All About Food. I'm very excited today. We have a very special guest, Ralph Nader, and his bio is very long. I'm just going to touch on a few things. He's one of America's most effective social critics. His analyses and advocacy have enhanced public awareness and increased government and corporate accountability. He's founded groups or has inspired groups which include Public Citizen, the Center for Auto Safety, the Center for Science and the Public Interest, the Clean Water Action Project, the Pension Rights Center, Public Justice, Princess Project 55, and the Appleseed Foundation. And he's an author, lecturer, attorney, political activist. He was cited by The Atlantic in 2006 as one of the 100 most influential figures in American history. Time magazine has called him the U.S.'s toughest customer. And in 1974, a survey conducted by U.S. News and World Report rated him as the fourth most influential person in the United States. He's the author of many books, and you can find out more about him at his website, nader.org, as well as the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. And I want to introduce him today. Ralph Nader, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, we are not talking about any of these political books, or we might touch on them a little bit today, but what we're focusing on is a new book being released, The Ralph Nader and Family Cookbook, Classic Recipes from Lebanon and Beyond. My first question is, why write a cookbook? Well, several reasons. Over the years, as I got involved in pushing for safer meat and poultry inspection and food safety generally and nutrition, people would ask me, well, what, what do you eat? What, what did your parents feed you when you were growing up? So, you know, I'd answer here and there. And so I decided to put it all in a, in a, in a book with a, a long introduction about uh, some of the ways my parents raised their four children in an industrial town in New England, and um, I think it's very valuable for especially parents of young children because uh, page nine shows um, the way my mother got me to stop whining about food and eat up the celery, carrots, and radishes. And the rest of the answer to your question is that it occurred to me years ago that the uh, Mediterranean diet in the Middle East has been viewed by leading nutritionists everywhere as the best diet of any ethnic uh, region in the, in the world because it has less fat, sh salt, sugar. It's very diversified in uh, grains and uh, vegetables and fruits. It's low on meat. And it has an enormous uh, uh, connection between nutrition and deliciousness. And uh, my mother always used to say, if something's nutritious, it's likely to be delicious. And indeed, when you see some of these products that rumble across the plains from California to New England or from Mexico to New England, like rubberized tomatoes, they've really lost a lot of their nutrition. And they don't taste very good. So this book is, uh, is uh, you know, one for all seasons. Uh, I think it's a great Mother's Day and Father's Day book. And most interesting, uh, you can get all, almost all the ingredients in your local grocery store or supermarket, except maybe pine nuts sometimes are in short supply. And uh, moreover, it, as we all know, uh, vegetables and fruits tend to be cheaper than, um, you know, heavy steaks and and pork chops, etc. And so it meets the family budget. It's accessible, and the recipes are very easy to make. My mother insisted, and most of the recipes are hers. My mother insisted on simple recipes that you can use your own judgment to alter. She used to call them "use your own judgment" recipes. 
Well, I have to say that I agree with you on all these points. The show, as I mentioned, is called It's All About Food. And I feel like we can connect many of the social ills to what's going on today with our food and our food choices. And a lot of just so many things are connected to our food. So it's important. And the solutions, as we can see in your book, are relatively simple. Now, I have to tell you that Lebanese, I have a special connection with Lebanese food, which is why I, this book resonated with me a bit. Um, I'm, I'm a vegan. I've been vegan for almost 32 years and a vegetarian for longer. And I actually became vegan while working for an Israeli company, and I was in Israel. And uh, it was a lot easier to eat there uh, because of that. And then when I traveled around the world as an engineer and worked in a variety of places, I always look for Lebanese restaurants because I knew I would be able to get fresh, delicious vegan food uh, and a lot of variety. And no other <laughs> cuisine was like that because if I went to an Indian restaurant, which focused on being vegetarian, there was a, a lot of things were cooked with the clarified butter, the ghee, or a Chinese restaurant, for example, which has lots of vegetable dishes. Many of them were cooked in chicken broth. So. Uh, the Lebanese cuisine, when it came to vegetables, was the most appropriate for me, and, and I've eaten in many of them around the world. Fortunately, there are a lot of them now. When I was growing up um, in the United States, there were really only two kinds of ethnic restaurants. One was Chinese, and the other was Italian-American. And, and now there are like 25 Ethiopian restaurants in the greater <laughs> Washington, D.C. area alone. So so there's been a real expansion of ethnic uh, cuisine, a great contribution to diet. And uh, we don't have people going to the supermarket much anymore and buying Wonder Bread, uh, which you can squeeze, uh, and, you know, like, like putty, and it's nutrition drained out of it. Um, one thing that makes this book really timely, Karen, is uh, that in an – midst of this coronavirus, when everybody's recommending this and that, there isn't that much emphasis on uh, improving your nutritional content in your diet. And so for people who live very much on Frito-Lays and Hostess Twinkies and very fat food, um, their immunity is not likely to be as strong as uh, it, it would be if they switch to a more diversified and nutritious diet like uh, like is suggested in, uh, in this book. Um, and while, you know, uh, a, a nutritious diet is not a cure or even a mitigator so much of the virus, it does improve your resistance, and we want to recommend it for that purpose as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. We talk about that all the time on this program, and uh, I wish more people would get that message out. So you mentioned your mother and her recipes, and I love the story in the beginning of the book. You talk about how she raised you and your siblings, and it's kind of a romantic image, but at the same time, it's, it's important, and somehow culturally we've lost some of these simple things about the family gathering for a meal every day, eating together quietly, um, with conversation, no distractions, like everybody looking at their smartphones and a eating um, whole simple foods that are nutritious and delicious. I say that all the time, nutritious and delicious. Uh, simple things like when the child is being a picky eater, uh, the, the, the way your mother handled it was, was beautiful and the way – We've kind of lost that as a culture, where the children kind of rule and make decisions when they're not really prepared to do that. So I appreciate yeah, they, that. Yeah, they just they, the kids today tend to, in many families to dominate the dinner table and with agitation, with distraction, with complaints about how certain food is prepared or their demands for sugared food. Um, and uh, right from the beginning, our parents basically said, look, we're going to eat what you eat and you eat what uh, we eat. There's no double standard. And getting together is a good time to 
go over the day, what happened in school, talk about issues, um, make humor, uh, but we're not going to be looking at anything else. Of course, there was no TV then, but even if there were, there would be no TV on, there would be no radio on. And now you have children with uh, the, the cell phone in their hand while they're eating. And it's very, very destructive. Uh, family uh, exchanges, uh, the wisdom being communicated from parents to children, uh, family tranquility. I mean, there's got to be a time when it, it's technology-free, technology-free hours. Uh, human being interaction cannot be mediated by the Internet. And uh, we've forgotten that, I think. And this book is... Uh, is an attempt to bring it back in very concrete ways. I mean, all this advice that's in the book uh, from my parents um, is nothing esoteric. And there's no sociological lingo. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just uh, good judgment. And for example, m my father ha ha ran a restaurant, and we had a family restaurant. And of course, in those days, you made. As, as much of the food as possible. It didn't come in plastic bags like uh, mashed potatoes. And he would make his own ice cream. And so as a family, we could have had ice cream every day, Karen. But enter my mother, who believed that abundance creates problems. And when it's taken for granted, it isn't appreciated as much, like children who have a huge amount of toys. So what she did is she held back our consumption of ice cream to about a dozen times a year. We'd go down to the restaurant, and my father would give us the ice cream coming out of the machine um, into a little cup and then into our waiting mouths. And did we ever appreciate it? But if we got it every day, we wouldn't even remember it as an occasion, as a special occasion. So we have to look at the wisdom of mothers and fathers here and and not expect PhDs to be after their name in order to be believed. And I think this book tries to convey that there are a lot of parents out there who have a lot of good things that they've conveyed to their children, but it's, it's never narrated. It's never put down in print. It's never tape recorded. And we're losing a lot of human history, uh, human wisdom, judgment, intuition, experience that way. Recipes in the book. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm a vegan, and I read every recipe in this book, and I thought I could make every one of these vegan for the ones that weren't. Now, many of them are already vegan, but it was kind of fun to get some new ideas about uh, dishes that I could make. And so I want to jump into that. Of course, uh, a big foundational ingredient, ingredient in a lot of these dishes is the laban, the yogurt, mm -hmm. which is a very important food because it has probiotics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we make a lot of yogurt at home with almonds and cashews rather than dairy milk. Mm. And it tastes like yogurt. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I really encourage people to learn how to make yogurt with your choice of milk. I prefer an unsweetened plant milk. And, uh, and get all those great um, healthy bugs, those good well, in terms probiotics. Of a, in terms of a special type of uh, recipe, uh, one of them is garlic soup, and it was contributed by the chef of a restaurant in Connecticut, New James, that has been rated one of the best uh, Middle East restaurants in the state. It has and 52 we, cloves of garlic in it. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> it, it doesn't feel that way. And mm -hmm. um, and so we asked him to contribute a couple uh, of uh, recipes. He contributed apple parsnip soup and garlic soup and, uh, and uh, other things. And it, it, it's mostly my mother's recipes, but some of our extended family contributed some of their own versions as well. Well, I'm glad you brought those up. Those two soups really popped out at me, the garlic soup. Uh, which, again, I can veganize with a cashew cream instead of a dairy cream. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything with roasted garlic just is so sweet and flavorful. So the, the garlic is cooked before pureed and added to the soup. That, 
that recipe popped out to me. And then the other with apple parsnip also. Just uh, uh, foods I haven't thought about combining. So I was excited about that. Uh, another, another one that doesn't appear vegan at all, but I can veganize it, is the cream cheese gelatin dessert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That can be altered in terms of use your own judgment, as my mother <laughs> would say. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a um, seaweed version of the animal gel gelatin called agar agar, and it works the same way. Mm -hmm. So that's handy. And, of course, there are many plant-based cream cheeses out right now. Some of them may be more processed than others, which I don't like encouraging, but um, it's there's a whole uh, movement now, which is really beautiful, making cheese from plant milks mm. in a kind of a French process, a kind of traditional cheese way. So that's kind of exciting. Um, I'm thinking, so I'm assuming you're at home now in Connecticut? Mm -hmm. In quarantine? Well, we're following the guidelines of the Centers for Disease Control. They make, they make sense. Yes. And more people now are cooking than ever, I hear. So they're not, exactly. they're, they're not going to restaurants. So <laughs> in a way, this book came out just at the right time f for the wrong reason. And uh, we, we would not have wanted a coronavirus context. But as long as people are staying at home, they can improvise, learn how to cook uh, these meals. There are over 40 recipes, and including appetizers and desserts and as i say they're pretty low on uh, fat sugar and salt and uh, uh, we had all kinds of book signings ready the new york times tv oh. book uh, was ready to do uh, a whole hour on it and so all we can do now is just encourage people to get it online and it's called the ralph nader and family cookbook classic recipes from Lebanon and beyond. And it's really more than a cookbook, as we've been discussing, Karen. There's a lot of good um, judgment about raising children and responding to their um, faults as children and uh, without pounding the table, just questioning them, smiling, and getting them to understand that not everything is sugary and sweet and melts in your mouth and yummy, uh, but uh, that uh, is not very good for you if you have too much sugar and and uh, too much salt. And pretty soon, you know, by the time they're 9, 10, 11 years old, they start thinking for themselves nutritionally. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many, many people I've met who've gone vegan or vegetarian, they did it when they were preteens, actually. Yes, I was 15 when I got on that path. Mm -hmm. A little late. But that was a long time ago. So I like to say love heals. I think love can heal a lot of the world's ills. And certainly when we're sitting around a table with our family around us with all of the love that's been put into the dishes, it can heal mm -hmm. a lot of things. There's definitely a lot of love in this cookbook. I'm thinking about this pandemic. Many of us are quarantined. Immediate families are together. And really together, they have to, like, acknowledge each other because they're just so present. Um, I don't know what's going to happen when we get through this, but I'm looking forward to some positive things that come out of this. Do, do you see, do you have any ideas of what may come, especially families eating around the table and cooking and eating together? Well, yes. Uh, obviously, uh, they'll understand what self-reliance is more about and not having to depend on fast food restaurants and everything being prepared. And all you have to do is heat it. There's a joy of cooking, as one famous cookbook put on its title. And, uh, and, and I'm being told, and I'm sure you are and others, that families are rediscovering each other. I have a friend, for example, who has two sons, and one of them wor worked in California, and the other worked in New York, and they hadn't seen each other, and now they're quarantined in their little farm, and they're rediscovering each other, doing things together, outdoors and indoors, and and repairing things, and so that that's that may be a really good plus because you know if anything, uh, the guidelines 
by the Center for Disease Control don't tell you to go more into virtual reality and spend all your life looking at a cell phone. Um, the encouragement is to help each other, reassure each other, and um, and, and discover uh, one another. We have uh, we have outsourced our lives from reality to virtual reality. I mean, the average uh, 10 or 12-year-old spends six, seven hours looking at screens every day, seven days a week. There was a, a survey of Baylor University students. They were spending uh, eight to 10 hours a day looking at screens, computer, iPhone, television. And um, that, that, that has its consequences on the, on the brain, on the mind on concentration uh, durations, on priorities, uh, on, you know, getting bits of facts that don't even weave together into knowledge, which never even get into judgment and uh, wisdom, and just overloaded with information that has no connectivity, no no meaning to it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's one of uh, nationally. I think the big lesson is we better start producing things ourselves more because the vast majority of medicines uh, was farmed out by the profiteering drug companies to China and India. I mean, when I tell people that there isn't a single factory in this country that produces uh, antibiotics or penicillin mm -hmm. uh, or any other drugs, not that they're all needed in that degree, but um, now we're caught short, and we're at the mercy of countries who have their own coronavirus problem and their own priorities in terms of supply, and we're going to be seeing shortages of medicines as we have seen shortages of face masks and uh, ventilators and even swabs. Imagine, the USA doesn't even produce its own swabs, it's heavily reliant on a big factory in northern Italy. And if you don't have swabs, you can't really do testing. It's like testing is only as good as the strongest link in in the chain. So that's another thing. I think we're going to pull back more production, and that will be good for workers and communities. And then the third thing, I think we'll realize that we, set, we cannot go through life as a non-citizen and, and not engaged in uh, local, state, and national politics. And the whole idea of millions and millions of people saying, politics I'm not into. Well, if people think politics is a dirty word, why are they surprised when they get dirty politics? So <laughs> all this stuff involving Trump's fibbing and lying uh, his way through and fumbling and saying factually wrong things, playing uh, quack doctor uh, overriding his scientific advisors, praising himself and rating himself with a 10, faking preparation, talking about supplies that aren't uh, being distributed, they've hardly been produced, and encouraging people to do the wrong things during the virus. Uh, all this uh, comes down to how we select our politicians and how we allow our elections to be in, uh, uninformed and how we let money uh, nullify our votes and we're paying the price. Yes, we're responsible. We are at fault. And uh, you're, you're quoted saying there can be no daily democracy without daily citizenship. We all need to participate and I hope we're learning that now. A couple more recipes I wanted to talk about, because this is about the Ralph Nader and Family Cookbook classic recipes from Lebanon and, and beyond. One of my favorites is fool, and you never, you rarely see that in restaurants and cookbooks, but every t time I have it, I love it. I've tried to make it a few times. Uh, it's not that easy to find fava beans, but you can if you look for them, but I love it. Yeah, you know, when I look at the uh, list of all these recipes, Karen, my my mouth literally waters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting hungry. It's like Pavlov, you know. <laughs> like um, uh, another another one is the madaradara. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Madaradara, the lentils yeah. with rice and onions. Right, lentils, uh, one of my favorites. Of course, hummus patini, baba ganoush. Um, Eggplant. Eggplant is one of my favorite, too. That is not catching on yet 
for millions no. of Americans. But you, you, my favorite uh-huh. recipe of all, it was so, so much my favorite, my mother made it for me on my birthday when I was a child. It, it's mm. called Shaykh al It's baked eggplant stuffed with lamb and pine nuts, tomatoes, and uh, it's just juicy. Uh, it's, it's just um, something that I have always savored. And, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, when you look at the at the desserts, oh, I mean, the rice pudding, the crunchy bran muffins, zucchini bread, uh, stuffed honey honeydew, and macaroon chashib with glazed sesame seed macaroons. And, uh, All delicious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I want to say that I want to try that eggplant dish, but of course I'm going to substitute for the lamb. Yes, I was going to say I'm that. I'm thinking of using either a mushroom or a tempeh or something, but with all the seasonings, it kind of takes over the flavor. Oh, yeah, and you don't it'll lose be that delicious. much. With, uh, with, uh, it's eminently substitutable. Okay, and one question. My, my, my parents are big on salads. We would eat the salad at the beginning of the meal, not with the meal or after the meal. Another be, smart yeah. thing. Yeah. And tabbouleh is there, fatouche, which is a combination of tomatoes, scallions, and parsley with toasted bread. And then there's Swiss chard salad. Yeah, yeah I, I, it wasn't until I got to Princeton that I realized that most people eat the salad either during the meal but after the meal. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, my mother thought that it was an appetizer. That is, it whetted your appetite for the main dish. Uh, salads are so important. I believe in eating a giant salad at least once or twice a day. And unfortunately, this culture has gotten so far away from that. And but, and in restaurants, for example, if you're not going to one that is geared towards eating healthfully and you want to eat a salad, usually the salad is like minuscule. You have to eat order several of them if you want enough. But there's one recipe in here I'm wondering where it came from because it doesn't sound very Lebanese to me, and it's the tofu and kale. No, it's not. It isn't Lebanese. Um, We were introduced to tofu when we uh, grew up, after we grew up. Uh, Tofu was not much in the American diet, And, uh, and then we learned about its nutritional uh, values and it, it goes so well with kale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know kale. You can have kale that's hard to chew, and and kale that's easy to chew. It depends how you cook it, of course. And when it's easy to chew and it isn't stringy, together with tofu, it, it's a knockout. I agree. We had tofu and kale yesterday in our tofu breakfast scramble, <laughs> <laughs> which of course was eggless. But uh, tofu and kale and onions and some spices, really, really yummy. Here's one that most people don't know about. Oh, cause there's, the Lebanese food, you cook very heavily with olive oil. You almost never use butter, except a little bit in some desserts. Um, but one is called uh, lubi bezait, which is string beans and olive oil. And mm. what a combination. What a combination. Uh, with a little onion sometimes. That's Another a one great is combination. beets with onions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beets with onions and olive oil. That's that's a great one for your digestive system. And how to make broccoli tasty? Well, <laughs> steamed broccoli with garlic, lemon, and olive oil out of this world. Maybe you could have gotten uh, the senior George Bush to like broccoli with that recipe. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I couldn't believe when he said he didn't like broccoli. That was like the beginning of. Oh, I don't know if it was the beginning, but of presidents not saying the appropriate things to lead this country. Yeah, well, especially with broccoli, which is coming on big, you know. It's it's almost a star in the last few years, I'm, I'm being told by chefs around the country. And that's mm-hmm. because they mix it in ways where the lack of good taste in just plain broccoli is... Uh, replaced with a combination of ingredients like garlic, lemon, olive oil. Well, I think part of it is not being used to the taste. And and since we've been manipulated to look for things that are sweet and soily, uh, sweet and salty and fatty, we don't appreciate the taste of natural foods and our, our tongue, our taste buds have been numbed. But 
Well, that's I mean, I'm at a six. point now where I love the bitter greens. I love yeah. the taste of steamed broccoli. I mean, it's also good with garlic and lemon and olive oil and those things. But it kind of helps people move over back to where their taste buds belong. Well, that's the tragic success of the fast food industry with kids over the last 40 years. They have basically taken over their taste buds so that kids will eat soup with MSG only, mm. but they can't bear the taste of natural soup without that flavoring in it. And therefore, they turn it down. And we've, we've all heard examples in the school lunch program where the children shove aside fresh vegetables, apples, fruits, because their taste buds have been conditioned for the fast food companies. Uh, it's almost pa a Pavlovian tragedy uh, where if you take control of a child's taste buds in your marketing, your TV ads to kids, everything is yummy, everything is sweet, um, you basically control their mind. You control what they say to their parents, what they demand, what they resist, and which is why I once wrote something about how corporations are raising our children more and more than the families, the parents themselves. And the parents have to contend with this every day. And very often they're harried, they're busy, they got two jobs, picking up at daycare, and they succumb to the demands for sweetness, excessive sugared food. So it becomes a vicious circle, and that's why we have to recover the identity and function of the individual family as a defense against the, the predatory, greedy practices of these big food companies. I'm sorry that you were not elected president of the United States. I supported your candidacy, candidacy, candid, I can't even say it, your campaign back in the mid-90s. And uh, now we have another campaign coming up. I'm wondering if you can comment on it, if you think we'll even have an election, and what you feel about the potential candidates. Well, again, it's a reflection of a majority of the people voting for political candidates who then turn against them because the majority of people believe the sweet talk and the sugar coating instead of doing their own homework and saying, I wonder what this politician has really done uh, as a senator or as a representative or as a state legislature. Uh, I don't care if, right at what he says. Politicians will say anything. But what he, was, what is he and she actually done and what am I going to demand of them if I have low expectations of candidates in office all the way to the president they're going to oblige us you have to raise the expectation level that's why I say if you're one issue citizen like you just care about abortion anti-abortion uh, you'll be manipulated by all the politicians who say <laughs> these people have given me a free ride on everything else on wars on uh, a tax policy, on pension uh, rights, on environment, on climate disruption, you know, it's great. But if you're a multi-issue candidate, you're going to have 10 or 12 things you want to scrutinize, uh, you become more powerful over these candidates. It's a tug of war. And uh, in 2020, once again, you see, we, we have turned away from Bernie Sanders who has a record of consistency uh, representing human beings and workers over corporations and wanting to bend government to be of, by, and for the people. He's almost incorruptible. I don't really know many politicians who've been in politics this long without any scandals. and lives a simple life, talks in clear language, and the, the, the political system is so full of trapdoors and circuitous rigging that he's not likely to get the nomination. Instead, we have another rerun of a corporate Democrat, Delaware Joe, I call him, because Delaware is the most mm. permissive state in the country for corporate chartering. And so they all these big corporations like DuPont, Citigroup, and General Motors, uh, all uh, file in, Del in Delaware because they can push around their shareholders and uh, concentrate power among the bosses. Um, that's the environment he grew up in, and he's been a, a faithful uh, minion of the banks, the credit card companies, 
and uh, has fallen prey to the kind of criminal justice that led to mass incarceration and excessive penalties on certain kinds of drugs that are cheaper and therefore purchased by minority groups. And this is all in the 1990s. And he was, of course, a um, supporter of all these unconstitutional wars. And uh, here we go again. So I like to think, Karen, that unless one or two percent of the American people start making Congress and the White House their their uh, their their uh, key preoccupation in their spare time, uh, like a hobby, you know, a Congress watchdog hobby. I've even written a fable called How the Rats Reformed the Congress to get mm -hmm. people laughing themselves seriously enough to read the rest of the book, which is how to take control of Congress. And if you can take control of Congress, and only 535 people, you can take control of the government and it has effects right down to the state and local level. That is how powerful Congress can be under the Constitution. It's the most powerful branch of the three branches, the tax power, the spending power, the war power, the confirmation power, the investigation power, on and on. And it surprises me no end that when I talk all over the country for years, start a Congress watchdog club. You know, some people play bridge. Some people collect coins. Hmm. Some people collect stamps. So spend three to 500 hours a year in a Congress watchdog and summon your senators and representatives to your own time meetings, your own agendas. And it's surprisingly easy to get them to come to you in person. 500 signatures with clear addresses and occupations will get a senator to your town or city for a town meeting. Okay, my listeners, that's your assignment, and we're now in quarantine, so you can start these Congress watchdog groups on Zoom or on phone calls, get people together, and start today. And if this pandemic doesn't change our, our old normal to a better new normal, I don't know what would make us change. Well, that's what I outlined in this little book, how the rats reform the Congress. And it's surprising. People are ordering it five at a time. So maybe they're starting <laughs> living room discussions that you can go to ratsreformcongress.org. It's actually autographed, ratsreformcongress.org. I put a lot of my experience in this book, and it's, it is very easy uh, to mobilize these groups back home. And as you know, Senator Representative, they they – care more about your votes than money from fat cats. But if you don't focus your vote and tie it into a series of demands for a better life and a better country and world, then um, they will uh, get, give preference to the money that they get from the fat cats because they got you pretty much uh, under their control. Uh, and this is what we have to uh, strive for and it really astonishes me how people refuse to understand that it's easier than we think to make change if a small number of dedicated people who know what they're talking about, representing public opinion, um, can turn around almost any major bad situation in this country. We can turn around poverty. They can turn around uh, crime, they can turn around the inequitable tax system, they can turn around the distortion of public budgets for bloated military empire while we starve public works and infrastructure, schools, bridges, highways, water, sewage systems all over the country. So I even wrote a little paperback uh, called uh, uh, It's Easier Than You Think, Breaking Through Power, It's Easier Than You Think, where I drafted the summons the summons that people would send to their senators and representatives and summon them back to their town meetings. But somehow people have lost confidence in themselves. They, they give up on themselves. And they know the big boys run the roost, and they're not willing to feel confident enough they can do anything about it. And then they start making excuses for themselves why they can't spend the time or do this or do that in a political arena and the electoral arena. So 
in modern communications and programs like this, we, we can turn it around. And it only takes 1% or less. That's the lesson of American history. Anything but the Civil War. All the major justice advances never took more than 1% of the people committing serious hours throughout the year in conjunction with each other. Uh, and, you know, that should be a source of encouragement. We made a lot of changes. We got the auto industry regulated for safer cars. We didn't have more than 3,000 people around the country helping us. We can do this. We, we can do can it do because mo most because you're reflecting public opinion. As Abraham Lincoln said, with public sentiment, you can do anything. Without public sentiment, you can't do very much. And there's so much left-right support. Don't fall for this divide and rule strategy of the ruling groups, people. Uh, they want to divide us. They want to divide and rule us. But uh, in, there are probably 60 major areas of this country that can be changed, and they have left-right support. Not all the left, not all the right, but about 70 to 75, 80 percent support. And that is unstoppable as a political force back home reverberating on your Congress and state legislatures. Unstoppable. They don't know how to deal with people who come into their office and they say, I'm conservative, I'm liberal, but we both want universal health care. We both want a safe food supply a decent tax system that's equitable. And they can't handle that. They're exactly. Used to we rules. all want the same thing. We want clean air, clean water, nutritious food, a roof over our head, and good education of and health care. Yeah. Uh, isn't that what we transit. all want? Yep. So that's our job, and we're the only ones who can do it, the citizens of our country. Wow. Well, thank you, Ralph Nader. We need your voice now more than ever. Thank you for your decades of hard work, for the books you've written, for your podcasts, and now the Ralph Nader and Family Cookbook Classic Recipes from Lebanon and Beyond. And thank you for taking the time to join me today on It's All About Food. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Well, you're very welcome, and thank you, Karen. It's been a very good conversation. Thank you for your program that goes on and on. Food? You can't get anything more important than that in terms of rebuilding the family unit. Thank you. Okay, stay strong, be well. Okay, you too. Stay in touch. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. That was Ralph Nader. What a great man he is. I don't know how much you know about Ralph Nader, but I highly recommend that, for one, you go to his Wikipedia page and read the summary about the work that he's done the challenges that he's had, and everything he's done has been for the public good. He's written many books. I recommend that you read some of them. Uh, most recently, as he was talking about in his program, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. I'm looking forward to picking that up. Fake President, which he published in December. He also wrote a book called Animal Envy back in 2016. And although Ralph Nader's not a vegan, and we mentioned uh, some of the recipes in his book have some animal products in them, um, he does acknowledge the, the sp special things about the other animal species we live with on this planet and their intelligence. And it all comes out in this fable called Animal en Envy that he wrote about four years ago. Anyway, you may not be able to tell by his very gentle voice in this interview that we just had what a mountain of work he is standing on, and he will be remembered in history as one of the most influential people in this country. So it was a great honor and privilege for me to speak with him and break some virtual bread. And now I want Gary DiMatte to join me, co-host of Responsible Eating and Living's program. It's all about food. Hey, Gary. Hi, Karen. That was a great interview. Uh, I'm still processing it. It's, as we say in the biz, it's it had it has really landed on me. And um, the part I took away, I mean, I took many many things away, and I'm going to listen to it again and again because it truly was inspirational. Um, it only takes one percent or less to make the kind of change we want. And 
how he talks about that movement, the 1% movement. I mean, I would like to talk about the 1% movement that we should all start. You know, everybody talks about... Everybody talks about the rich 1% that have more money than anything, but it will only take 1% of activists, loud activists working to make major change. And how they really do, they are really, they're, they're... their agenda is to divide us and to keep us divided, and they can't deal with it when we when we come together. I want to think that this virus will help us come together you know, because we all, we're all vulnerable. Exactly. We're all vulnerable. And um, you walk into an office, as he just said there towards the end of that great interview, and if you've got both sides walking in demanding the same thing, they don't know how to handle it. Clean water, health care. Uh, you know, education, as you mentioned, it's, uh, it was nutritious, really... clean, untoxic food, right? Yeah. That was is a... untoxic a word food without toxins. You know what I mean? Yes. Untoxic is a <laughs> word now. <laughs> so anyway, how's your week been going, Karen? That was great. Wow. What a milestone in the, uh, in the program here, the 11 years of, it's all it, about, it's food. all about food to, to, uh, talk to Ralph Nader. Well, we're here at the Responsible Eating and Living Pandemic Headquarters. Yes. And unfortunately, the background music is very often ambulance sirens. We hear them more and more this week. We're here in the epicenter in New York City. They're having more deaths of the coronavirus, although there is some hope that the number is stabilizing and hopefully we've reached a peak and it will start to recede now. But I've heard some really positive things about what we can do, we've talked a lot about meditation and, and, and great nutrition to build up the immune system, but here's something else. Maybe some of you have been listening to Chris Cuomo, the mayor of our governor, Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo. The brother of our governor. Oh, did I? What did I say? The mayor? You said the mayor. The brother. <laughs> a mayor would be a horse to the... And you don't want to call Chris a horse. No, so we have Governor Andrew Cuomo. His father, Mario Cuomo, was also governor. Ooh, I like how you said Mario. Yes, and we now have a bridge named after him. And I want to... And apparently they left the middle initial out of his name on some plaque and they had to spend a gazillion dollars had to have that redone. But let's put that aside. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Cuomo, unfortunately has the virus and he's been broadcasting his his journey uh, with it. A video journal of just him talking to his listeners, right? Yes. About and, what he's going through. Yeah, and the, the last one he had produced was very compelling, but he said something that was important, and that is that if you do get the virus and you're finding you have difficulty breathing, Resting is not what you want to do. What you want to do is work the lungs. You want to lift your arms above your head. You want to take deep breaths and it will hurt and it will be difficult, but it is necessary. And that's true of a lot of things that can happen in the body where people say, oh, just let it rest where you need to actually work it. You've experienced that with your shoulder. Yes. um, Many people told me that uh, I had this frozen shoulder and uh, a lot of people said, oh, just, you know, don't move it, go get surgery. And um, I didn't want surgery. So I did some research and discovered that I don't want to keep it still. I want to move it. And so I did a lot of exercises. My cousin Nancy uh, hipped me to, uh, to some of these Egoscue exercises. You told me, Karen, some great yoga exercises. My brother Mark was showing me some exercises as well. And um, it takes time, but in less than six months, I was able to move my shoulder again. So I can see uh, and and relate to what you just said, because I think movement is the key in a lot of these diseases where we're told just sleep, get rest. Uh, I think it's the opposite, really. So this virus can create a cytokine storm where the lungs are filled with this fluid and and stiffens the lungs and makes it difficult and then impossible to breathe. And the idea is to work your lungs, increase your lung capacity so that your immune system ultimately, and if you're in a hospital, um, they will aid you in, in getting well. Of course, we hope none of you get the virus, but building lung capacity is important for this and for all of life. So I, I'm going to link on the, the show description today a Simha Kriya yoga, 
yogic process to boost immunity immunity and expand lung capacity and i've been doing it for a few days gary you've joined me doing it yeah it's wonderful and i recommend it it just takes like three minutes it's not long at all yeah it's it it uh, it really helps i all like that's all i can say is it really helps it helps your whole mental attitude as mm -hmm. well as obviously your physical how you're feeling physically i mean it really does and um I've been doing it too just before meditation. It's kind of like a good way to start to focus before you go into some program. Anyway, you don't have to meditate to do this, but I do recommend boosting your immunity and expanding your lung capacity now and always. I also wanted to mention tomorrow, April 8th, Dr. Michael Greger is offering a webinar. He's offering tips for optimal respiratory and hand hygiene, proper mask usage, how to make a do-it-yourself sanitizer solution and how to prep for sheltering in place. And he's also discussing the source of the virus and how we can treat and cause and prevent future animal to human disease outbreaks. The downside is this webinar is already filled, but he will be posting it after tomorrow to view on his website, nutritionfacts.org. So look for that. I'm sure it'll yeah, be let's interesting and informative. Let's just touch a little bit more on Michael Greger. He was uh, one of the uh, people who was outspoken about what's happening to us now. He gave us, oh, he's been warning us about um, the effects of a pandemic for a decade. And um, you know, I know we've talked about this before on the show. You know Michael personally. And he was talking to you about these things 10 years ago. Right? Well, he put out the book, The Bird Flu, and I recommended a online link where you could read the book for free he's taken that link down because he's updating the book right so one of the quotes from michael is the two greatest threats facing humanity according to the united nations are climate change and emerging infectious disease particularly pandemic influenza here we are so um again i'm going back to what your great interview just now with um with ralph nader if they divide us, they can rule us. Just think about that for a minute. Let it land on you for a second. And what do you think is happening to us now? We are divided yes. and, we're, and we are being ruled. We are being ruled to the point where um, this infectious disease at first wasn't taken seriously by our federal government. So, and now folks are backpedaling. Uh, we need to come together on this, folks. And it only takes, as R Ralph Nader just pointed out, 1% of both sides to get together and agree. And a lot of change can be made. And again, I'm not going to try and paraphrase what just went down between Karen and Mr. Nader. So listen to it again and again and again, because it will be up on the site uh, tomorrow, most likely to be downloaded and listened to whenever you can. But, uh, I'm thinking about everybody who's in quarantine, and I've read some articles on this, a lot of times students are home with their parents, families are together who do ha who have different political views. Right. And now they're in close quarters. And now it's time to come together as a community. Right. And really discover what those things are that we all want. Maybe we can educate each other a little, soften our egos a right. little, and hear the other person because we can't give up on each other, on no. ourselves. We need each other now more than ever. We can't give up. Let's just keep stressing that. And and, and Ralph Nader said it. He said it, it's food. It's with food that we can rebuild the family unit. So as we're rebuilding the family unit, we can rebuild the community unit. Right. And grow that to something that's powerful exactly making positive change there's some big holidays coming up i know that you are all probably going to be um feeling a little isolated yeah <laughs> how really. could you not uh being away from family i know personally i'm feeling isolated i'm not going to be around my family obviously karen is my family but um you know my immediate family and maybe some of you will be a part as well. We're doing some fun thing uh, that Karen's, we call him, Car we call Jared Karen's cousin. Yeah, he's but, my uh, sister-in-law's cousin. Sister-in-law's cousin. we love him. 
he uh, has organized a um, Karen's family. Karen was raised Jewish. I was raised Catholic, and we're in therapy. But uh, <laughs> he has arranged a seder on Zoom, which will be fun. We're going to do that Thursday. Yeah, and you know what's fun about that? We don't have to be at the same table with everyone else's food that we may not want to see or look at. There could be some, <laughs> there some, could be some benefits, benefits to, this. to this, right? So what do we wear? What do we bring to a Zoom Seder? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, that's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. But the one thing that I like about the Passover Seder, and if you're not Jewish or not religious, uh, you may not know the story. But it's a universal story. It frustrates me, too, at these Passover seders when some people don't make it universal. They make it just about the Jews. But it isn't. It's about all groups of people who are exploited. Uh, the story is about slaves and wanting to be free. Yeah, it's a universal story. It's a right. universal story. And, and it's uh, good to review that story and then make it current. Exactly. And so speaking of that, the plate, the plate, which is symbolic, and I... I'm new to the Seder, but now they're adding different things to the plate, correct? Right, to make things more current. Yeah. Good. Now there's an orange, which is some... It's to some... represent women, or women as rabbis. Right. So and, it's yeah. uh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, we have like a minute and a half, believe it or not. Okay. Happy and... holidays to you all. <laughs> um, I just, I wanted to mention... Um, there's a new recipe at ResponsibleEatingAndLiving.com. I call it, we need a little Christmas lima bean soup. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Rancho Gordo heirloom beans, but we have a lot of different ones because Gary's sister graciously gifted us yes, a thank variety. You. And I was looking at the Christmas lima beans recently. They're beautiful. They're like beige buff colored and then splashed with a deep maroon. And I was looking at them. Christmas lima beans, Christmas lima beans. And the song from MAME came to my head. We need a little Christmas right, right this, this very, very minute. minute. Candles in the window, carols in the spinach. And we need, need yeah, little... anyway, we need a little Christmas. We need lighthearted feelings. And so I thought I would make a soup with these Christmas lima beans. We need a little Christmas lima bean soup. And uh, It was delicious. I, I loved it. I ate two bowls of it last night. And it's... Really good. Yeah, so the recipe is there for you. It's got cabbage, and it's just nourishing. And what can people do to help donate some food? We have some friends who are donating some food, right, Karen? Yeah, uh, there are restaurants probably all around the country. I don't know. They're suffering, too, because they don't have work. But here's a win-win situation. For example, Blossom in New York. BlossomNYC.com forward slash Blossom Gives Back. That you can donate on their website, and they will send meals to the healthcare workers in the hospitals that are doing that are front amazing. line they're yeah. doing the amazing ICU work. Unit. they they fed the IC unit in Mount at Mount Sinai Hospital right and then there's Mount Marty's vegan burger Marty we love Marty and if you go to his website on his menu you can donate burgers and salads to send to the healthcare workers the website for that is martysvburger.hngr.co Marty's V, like vegan, burger, B-U-G-E-R dot H-N-G-R dot co. B-U-R-G-E-R, right? B-U-R-G-E-R. Okay, yeah. good. Well, and we'll put, it on the, we'll put it on the page today so yeah, you can copy you can, both of If you're things. feeling helpless and you want to help, you can help restaurants serve the people at the front lines. And let us know if you're doing anything like that and we'll broadcast it here on the show. Just info at realmeals.com. Org. Org. Info at realmeals.org. Well, that's the end of this program. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Nader. Thank you, PRN, for all the great work you're doing. Oh, yes. Thanks to Progressive Radio Network. Shout out to Progressive Radio Network and all the guys there. Jesse, Alex, thank you for being there. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, Gary Null. Have a delicious Have week. Have a delicious week. Bye. Bye. 